Well, I am honored to be here. I've been informed I'm the first non-faculty member to get to do this. So thank you very much. Um, so today, we're going to talk a little bit about the iPad, iPhone, really all the same. Um, I would like this, though, to be uh, interactive, please. It's not meant to be a lecture. I have some things that um, I'd like to show you, but my experience with technology ever since I've been in the field is that if I sit down next to somebody, Rodney's got his iPad over there, he knows how to do something I've never seen before. I can guarantee that. Because everybody finds things that they know or that they like or some trick that they've learned, uh, a great app that they have. So I want to make sure that we have an opportunity here for people to share those things with everybody. By no means do I have the complete list of everything you should ever have or do. And the rumor that we were giving them out here, I'm sorry, that's not right. You know, probably everyone's going to get up and go now. Um, and of course, um, I just wanted to mention that this really came out of um, uh, Lynn and I uh, working on our phones uh, last year. And you know, finding problems, solving them, getting them connected, doing all those things. Um, and so I am using an app that is called Slide Shark. And what it does is it allows you to take your PowerPoint and display it, annotate it, record over it. Um, you can do a lot of great things with it. And of course, it's an iPad and an iPhone app. And so for this presentation, what I'm trying, and of course, I've only played with this in the last day or so, um, is the iPad is connected uh, with a cable to what would be considered the laptop connection in all the smart classrooms. Okay. To be connected to the data projector, no. But you will notice that I am not standing at the iPad because there is a Slide Shark app for my iPhone. And what the app is going to allow me to do is advance the slides uh, without having to sit next to this. So it'll act like a remote presenter. Um, it even has a little um, laser pointer, but I had a little trouble making it work very well. So that probably just takes a little more practice. Um, so slide chart. There are many other ways to do this. And with most things computer, there are a variety of ways to do the same thing. So, you know, nothing here is really meant, again, to be the absolute last word. And please, for people that want to use these in your classroom, you look right at the camera for this, <laughs> talk to multimedia services. <laughs> Give them a call. Tell them, I would like to use this in my classroom. They will help you. If they don't know what it is you're trying to do, they'll figure it out. Okay? Test. I have tested this literally on this rig. I've tested it on the rig in the ITDC so that I knew with any luck it would work. Okay? So please let us help you if you discover there are things you want to do so that when you're in class, they'll be successful. Right? A little practice goes a long way. So I wanted to talk first about getting online because, of course, the iPad's no good without that. We've made some changes and we're making improvements to the wireless network that you see on the campus. And so everybody with a wireless device, if you would like to follow along at home, as they say, um, and it, it does not have to be an Apple device. So if you happen to have your Android phone with you or your Windows tablet, you're fine to take it out. When you look under the available wireless networks, you should see a couple. And the two that will be the most noticeable 
Our LBCC Secure, which is a new name, we just did that last night. <laughs> well, we were going to do it anyway, and this was a good excuse to get it done, as they say. Um, and then you see there's always just LBCC. LBCC is a guest access wireless network. It is for people to use uh, who do not have to tell us who they are. And because all the students use it, we have limited some of the things you can do on it. And I don't want to get too computer jargony, but some, some programs won't work on it because we only really allow web traffic. So if the thing you want to do doesn't really use the, the web as its medium, it may not work. But LBCC Secure will prompt you for your username and password. And once you log on, it's as if you logged on to the computer in your office. Yes. All right, see, I made one person happy. I can go. I'm done. That's it. Um, and so if you have a laptop, the shares that are mapped on your computer won't show up automatically, but we can help you make those appear on your laptop so they will show up at different times, you know, the next time you come. This is what I want you to use, LBCC Secure. The other thing that is good about it is it, because you have to log in, it affords a greater level of technical security for your traffic. So your, the things you do with your wireless device are safer from people trying to eavesdrop on your wireless traffic. They are much safer if you use LBCC Secure. So please, that's one of your takeaways for today. Yes. Tried it, didn't work. No, no, no. You helped me uh, set up an FSWNWA. Yes. You know, it is still fine. What we've done is we had a faculty staff wireless network that did the WPA security protocol. So what did we do? We called it FSWN-WPA. It seems a little friendlier to have one out there that says LBCC Secure. And so we really, it's the same idea. There's, there's really no difference. But this is much easier to explain to people. It also turned out that some Android devices had trouble with the dash. So we've taken that away to make that easier. OK, so try to avoid the LBCC wireless unless you have trouble with the secure, then you can use it. But the secure is a much better way to go. Your um, device should remember that you logged into it. And every time you come back, it should just log back in. And it should only be some rare glitch that would force you to have to log in a, another time. So when you get online, you will see it says here, LBCC Secure. That's what you want. It'll ask you to enter your password, your username and password. It is the one you use for everything. It's the password I just made most of you change. So put in the new one when you do. All right. You got to get your iPad connected. So for Mac, users in general. You have a Mac laptop, you have your iPad, you have your iPhone. Go and get the connector. Cost about $39. Go and buy the connector that fits for your device and that does something called VGA. And you will be able to plug into any smart classroom. Now, at home, I have a connector that does something called HDMI, so that I can plug my iPad into my TV and, you know, watch Netflix and do stuff like that. To be perfectly confident that any smart classroom will allow you to plug in 
get the connector that says VGA. Now, good question you may be asking yourselves is why don't I just have them for you? There's a problem, and otherwise we would. See this part of the connector? This is the part that goes into your iPad or iPhone. We're already on two different versions of that. My iPad um, has a different connector than that. Many people's iPhones, if you don't have a 5, have a different connector. Some people have this. The Mac laptops are unfortunately notorious for changing the video out. So just buy yourself the connector that works for your device and just carry it around with you. And you will be assured of having the right thing to connect. And that's really, you know, I'm sorry that I can't just have them for everyone, but you want to walk in and be confident that your things will work. Email. Email is very simple to set up if you have an iOS device. Now you know that the, what they call the operating system, what runs your phone, right? In the Apple world, they call that iOS. And so they typically say iOS devices to include things like the iPhone and the iPad together. If you have, you know, an iOS device, the key thing that you need when you do this Oh, I guess I have to walk in front here. So now I'm going to get to play with this for a second, just for fun. Is right there. And that's where it says mail.lbcc.edu. Other than your username and password, for the most part, that's everything you need. You typically do not have to enter the domain, which says lbccd. But you could write that down, LBCCD. We have a help page for this on the ITDC website. But it's really pretty simple. And we're finding that it mostly just works for everybody without a lot of intervention. Of course, we'll be happy to help anyone that has trouble with this. You know, when that rings, I should just change slides. That was very good. OK. Um, Try to maximize the picture a little, but let's do that. All right. I think that one of the most important tools for you educationally when you have a device is being able to take a screenshot. Right? Almost the number one thing that uh, people wind up doing when they're teaching about stuff. And so you push the top button and then hit the home button while you're holding the top button down and you will take a screenshot and it will go into your photo library okay people have experimented with this and it goes where it goes into uh, the photo library whatever that's called my photos you know see and so as I was building this presentation because I built it on my PC in PowerPoint, I would take screenshots and then go into my photos and simply mail myself the photo. Mm -hmm. And then I would take the photo, because I was working on my PC to create this, and simply put it into PowerPoint. So, you know, there's a, a photo on my desktop. This is under the tips and tricks category. Did you know that if you double tap the shift key, you turn caps lock on? Some, it's the smallest things that turn out to be that make people the happiest. This, for me, was great. So double tap. Now in an iPad, you can also tap each shift key at the same time, and it will turn caps lock on as well. But that takes two fingers, and you can just double tap right there and turn on your caps lock. Like I said, tips that you know, little tricks that you've got, that you enjoy, just feel free to, you know, let me know. Raise your hand, do something. I like the shift, the, the space key to make sure. 
Yes. So you know that if you um, if you tap that um, twice, tap that twice, you will get a period and then a space. So you don't have to shift to another keyboard. You don't have to ever bring up the period key to put a period at the end of a sentence. Well, because you get the period in there. Well, no, you have to otherwise hit the key that has the period. Yeah. You might know this one where you just hold on to the, to the uh, period and question mark that turns into dot com, dot net. Oh, we're going to get that one I have for you. I have that for you. Jordan, I'll show you. We're such easy crowds. It doesn't take much, does it? Okay. No, no. Okay, so. Everyone that has one of these iDevices, if you have your device out, I want you to double click the home button. And it will show you the programs that are running on your iPhone. Okay? Now, this is showing it for the updated iOS 7. If you've never updated your phone, then you really just see the little icons on the bottom. In iOS 7, if you want to really end a program so that it's not having any chance of running in the background, you take your finger and you flick this guy up. And he goes away and he's not running anymore. Now, you don't need to do this like in the old days of computers where we worried about resources. The place to do it, though, is sometimes you run programs that you know are very battery intensive. I run a GPS program when I hike. And it's great. I love it. How far did I go? How high did I climb? Even how far down I went? It gives you all this wonderful information on your hike. But the GPS activity is very battery intensive. And so even though I stop the program, I'm a little paranoid that while it's still there, it may be somehow sucking up my battery that, that I'm unaware of. So I typically will kill that program after I'm done. The information from Apple is that you really don't need to do that. The programs are designed to not use resources when they are not the active program. But I have a little paranoia, and mostly today mine's really the only issues I, I, I ever have, for the most part, are battery, which pretty much everyone has to some degree. So it's really good if you have something that you think is intensive on your battery use. It's also good if the program stops working. So you have a program and it just won't work, it won't do the right thing, the screen's frozen. If you double click and you literally just flick it like you were, like here I have my sky in the background, like I'm just trying to throw it up in the sky, it, go, it, it will be stuck. And so it's very good, occasionally, you know, programs do crash. Okay, I just learned this trick. And I heard that this, is a, that this works on uh, Android and other devices like the Windows tablet as well. If you press and hold down on a link, this box will come up. And what this box is showing in the top line where the arrow is, is the URL, the address that the link is going to. I wrote securitylbcc.edu is the name of the link, but the real link is http colon slash slash, this could be a hacker.html. So when you get an email and you are concerned about, is this something I should really click on? One way to know is to look at what the actual address is. 
The fact that the fake email from Chase says, log into your Chase account, and they have all the graphics, and here, yeah, just come on in. And it looks beautiful. It looks like Chase sent it. But if you hold your finger down and you get this box to come up, you'll see that the address is in Russia. The address is definitely not chase.com. So it's one way to be able to look at the things you're doing and make sure that you feel they're safe and reliable. This is easy to do on a computer by and large. Until I learned this trick, I thought I didn't know how to do it on my iPhone. Keyboard shortcuts, Jeff. There's many of them, and I would tell you to simply Google keyboard shortcuts on the iPad. Because really, there were too many for me to show. But this is an example of a couple. If you hold down the dollar sign, you get other countries, um, you know, currency. So it's one way to put, the, like, the euro in, as an example. If you are in Safari, you're in your browser, and you're typing an address, if you hold down the period, you get some, some typical endings to web addresses. You see edu, net, org. Certain letters will yield special characters associated with those letters. Okay? So, you know, if I send Jose Ramon an email and I don't want it to say Joe's, right? I want to put in an E that has the accent. I can hold down the E key and one of these will be it. Right? Now, you don't need two hands to do this. Your finger's here. Up comes the list, you slide your finger to the one you want, and that's the letter that gets used. Does everyone understand that? And the sliding is something that works very well on the iPad or the iPhone. As an example, if you hold the shift key and the keyboard changes to all the capital, just slide your finger to the capital. If you hold the number key, and you see all the numbers, you can slide your finger to the number, and then when you let go, you are back at the letters. So you don't have to go, give me the numbers, I want number one, give me the letters, and now I want the letters. Simply hold down the number key, find the number, slide your finger to it, and then you're back to your, where you were typing before. You have a few more tips and tricks out there of your own. I hope I'm going to hear them. Okay, I wanted to talk about some things that I think are helpful. And you know, everything is different for different people. What's helpful, what's not helpful. These are just suggestions. I am a big fan of Dropbox. There's Box.net, there are other services, there's um, Google, uh, Microsoft has SkyDrive. It really doesn't matter. But I'm a big fan of cloud-based storage. Right? Does everyone know, by the way, what I mean when I say cloud-based? You know, it's out there in the internet somewhere. <laughs> floating around, we don't know where, it's somewhere. And the reason for that is these companies can provide services that today we can't provide for you. Now, we would like to provide these services, and we're moving in those directions, but the reality is today I can't give you storage that you can access from anywhere. And I certainly can't give you the amount of storage that these places will give you for free that you can access from anywhere in the world. And so I think that this is a really valuable tool for you to have. Many iPad applications will integrate with these services. So SlideShark that I'm using to display this PowerPoint, 
One way that I was able to put the PowerPoint on the iPad, in essence, was to have it be in my Dropbox account. And then one of the options for how to bring a file up was Dropbox. I gave it my login and password. And the next thing I knew, I saw my entire list of files in Dropbox. And then I picked this presentation. Obviously, you have to have the one. <laughs> How could I come here and not tell you that you had to have the moon lab? See? Um, and you know, and it's okay. It's not the greatest thing in the world, by the way, but it works pretty well. And you know, it's something that they will improve over time. I think that a video editing program is something that you should have in your iPad toolkit. There are some free ones, but my experience with the free ones is they tend to be very limited. This cost $4.99. So, you know, obviously not free, but not a serious investment. Being able, I was putting together a little movie of pictures from a trip to Costa Rica. And it's classic iMovie. You can have sound, you can put in titles, you know, you can do many things. Um, but video editing is something that I think everybody should have in their toolkit. And it's, um, I, I have my professional video editors right here, Jerome, Fred. Everyone knows Jerome and Fred, I hope. If not, Jerome Thomas, Fred Rossmanick. Are you telling them for a reason? Yes. <laughs> first, of all, when, first of all, when you want to work on instructional video, they are the people to help you. Um, Thank you. But I don't have their skills in doing that. And I'm never going to have their skills in doing it. And so what I need is something that lets me do, for me, what the basics are. And that's why I think these programs can be very useful uh, for things that you want to present in your classroom. And the other reason is because I try to send videos like via email and stuff, and you're only limited to like 30 seconds. Yeah. And you can only, like, it's over a minute and I don't know, 15 seconds. It makes you. Okay, well, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, you know, there are size limits on attachments, and that may be what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, having some video editing, I think, would be is a really valuable thing for you to have. Does, has anyone here ever used CCC Confer? Glad I got that response. There is, for free, a Blackboard Collaborate app for the iPad. And you can do CCC Confer right from your iPad. Okay. I find it works pretty well. I tried it. Um, oh, and by the way, when you go to take a screenshot, you can't take it on every screen that your iPad shows. So when I fired up CCC Confer, the screenshot didn't work. So I took a picture with my iPhone and sent it to myself. So just when, you know, after showing you about screenshots, it apparently doesn't work all the time. Some apps you can screenshot. I guess there are some applications that it just is not enabled. I really don't have an explanation. But CCC Confer is one of the most valuable tools that we have at our disposal. Completely free for you to use. Unlimited use as much as you want. You can do online office hours. You can do those in Moodle, but you can do them with this. You can have interactive sessions with people. You can use an online whiteboard to have discussions. You can share video, you can share applications, right? So you can 
Uh, I know it's being used for some meetings. You can uh, show documents. You can teach people how to run software. You can do pretty much anything you do on your computer. So this is a really valuable tool for getting the iPad that I just want to recommend for everybody. And it's at cccconfer.org, I believe. I think so. And um, you create an account for yourself, which takes 10 seconds. And then you, are L then you can just use it. And so it's really a great tool. This is another really cool app. It allows you to create presentations. And it's set up to lead you through the process and to help you create them. And so there are many, I'm going to show one more after that. Um, there are many things you can do, but it, it's nice, it really lets you um, animate, narrate, all those kinds of things. And so for example, a study that came out earlier this year that I read in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Screencasting is a technology that students appreciate. And so screencasting is showing something and narrating. So you want to show your students how to do something. You're showing them the screens of how to do it, and you are narrating it as they watch it. Go to this, do this step, a good paper has this, right? So how is this similar, different from a, a typical PowerPoint presentation with embedded video and so on, and custom animation? Is it, I, I'm trying to... It, it's the same idea. Okay. Um, the, the more technical difference about screencasting okay. is that typically it's very focused on um, a specific topic and it is really about how to do something. That's what the students seem to appreciate. Whereas many PowerPoint presentations, they cover a gamut of topics and subjects, right? So a screencast on how to uh, do footnotes properly, how to do you know, anything would be really focused and it would take the person step by step and they're not, you know, it's not the talking head video, it's the task at hand with narration on how to complete it. We have a program Camtasia in the ITDC that you can come use, does the same thing. You know, this is one that you can do using your iPad. Story Robe is just a different take on that. And it's another app for creating presentations, very storyline based. When would you use one versus the other? I think you would use one versus the other based on how you enjoyed using the program. Okay. I don't think that there's a lot of difference in the basics of what they do. Okay. But the interfaces are a little different. Some of the things they allow are different. Um, and so it's really more about finding a tool that you feel comfortable with, right? <laughs> you had a funny look? No, no. No, you know, in other words, these, many things do the same task, but you want to find one that you feel comfortable working with. I, of course, have to tell you that there are many iPad videos on the lynda.com website. I get to be a broken record. This is fun. Um, but there are. There are uh, classes on apps. Um, I actually am taking the iPad music production series of videos myself. Um, there are um, things on this. This is very good about using the iPad with students who have iPads. So, you know, if we were to someday get a card of iPads, like we used to do cards of laptops, uh, these videos are really about how to use them in the uh, classroom effectively, when the students have them. Um, and then, of course, I didn't have to come. I could have just told you to watch this video, <laughs> the iPad tips and tricks. Is that something you can suggest to the department? I would love to have a mobile. Like just be able to bring a card 
iPads and say, let's do research on this. Just put an iPad in everyone's hand, this is a laptop, we can all get into the wireless net, I can show them how to, say, narrow their search, and then they can go to it on an iPad. Is that possible? Well, I, I think the first step is that as your department does its program plans, that that kind of information goes into it. Being completely serious right now, um, there are some things that have to be done here from an infrastructure point of view to, um, to be able to accommodate that. And we've actually started doing that. So while I wouldn't be ready today if we could go out and buy a cart of iPads, I would like to be ready sometime next semester. So the answer really is yes. Okay, great. We need here, and it's interesting because this is in this video about iPad classroom fundamentals. Managing the iPad is the challenge. From my, my managing of the iPad is the challenge, not yours. And so um, that's the thing we haven't completely resolved yet. Meaning, you know, they all have to, you have to have an account. And the account has to be tied to a purchase order or a credit card. And we have to make sure that the iPads are maintained, that the updates are applied. Um, they're just the mechanics of the device and making sure that your experience and your student experience is reliable. That's the part that we're starting to work on. So I would love to see some faculty have some creative ideas for how to use these in the classroom, get them in your department plans, and let's try and make some of that happen over the next year. I think it would be great. We, for example, we put in for a lab in our program plan, as well as other things, but we did not have the classroom space to put, we had no classrooms for a lab. The one classroom we, we did have for a lab was not big enough to accommodate all the computers, so we said, why not use laptops then, make it a laptop lab? And they said, no, let's wait until we have a bigger space. But now you're saying we can have an iPad lab, and that just made me think, like, if we had something like that, not just for the department, but say from the larger media delivery perspective, like the whole school, that anyone could have a lab, perhaps, in any class, not just the English department. Right. No, the, the, the iPads or, uh, you know, another tablet. I mean, I, sure. you know, I happen to like my sure. iPad. We're, we've played with some of the Windows Surface tablets, and they offer a very different focus, but they're great. <coughs> you know, they're much more... Um, Windows work oriented, I want to say. Um, they, you know, we have Office for them. They take a USB, flash drive. I mean, they're much more designed to be like a mini laptop than your iPad is. But regardless of the type of device, um, I see a lot of opportunities to do exactly that. Our issue at the moment is making sure that we can effectively deal with it. And it is unfortunately a little complicated. And you know, you just want to turn them on, have the class turn them on, everything works. And so there is kind of a little bit of the man behind the curtain to make that happen. But I think it's a great idea, and I think you should be promoting it organically from within. You should have creative ideas for what you're going to do with it educationally and push it from that perspective, and then let me worry about how we can make it happen for you. So I would like to encourage you. All right, my last question is one I learned in a photography class. Are there any photographers in the room? One. I hear that when two photographers meet, this is what they say to each other. What's in your bag? Right? Um, and so, you know, this is a shot I got off of Flickr. Right? I hope everybody knows about Flickr. It's a great resource. Flickr is, you know, some people know about Shutterfly and, you know, all these photos, shit, Picasso, which is no more. Used to be the Google thing. Uh, it's a photo sharing site. What's great about Flickr is they um, recently changed their guidelines. Everybody gets a terabyte of space. So a terabyte is a lot of pictures. I am slowly in the process of uploading every picture I own, digital, so that it is backed up somewhere. 
I have DVDs going back many years of trying to save my pictures in case my computer crashed. This is a lot better. Flickr is a site that you then can find amazing pictures. People use what's called a Creative Commons license, which is really just a simplified approach to copyright. And when you see a picture that you wish to use, it's really easy to tell whether you're allowed to use it or not. And under what conditions are you allowed to use it. Most people let you use their pictures with attribution. So Gareth, we put his name up there because, you know, I got it from him. He took the picture. Um, so Flickr is a great resource. There is an app for Flickr, by the way. But it's more that Flickr is the place to put your pictures and a place to find pictures. And so, you know, when I've taught PowerPoint classes in the past, pictures are a much better way, in many cases, to make a point to an audience than text is. And in fact, there's something they call a picture superiority effect, which talks about how people can connect better, more emotionally, to a picture. So Flickr is a great place to find those pictures. Okay? So, in the last few minutes, I want to ask you guys, what's in your bag? So, it's, what's an app that you like, that you use on your, on your device? Okay, who has upgraded to iOS 7? Okay, who, wait a minute, who has not upgraded? Okay. I'll tell you in a second. See, some trouble running some of the programs if it's newer, it'll be easier. Well, you can tell also by um, there's a place to look. I have no problems with mine. I don't have, I haven't had any battery issues. Um, uh, the upgrade worked very smoothly for me. In fact, they, I just did 7.03 last night. Um, you know, it's, you really don't have to do it, except you will eventually. But today, if you're happy and you don't want to do it, you really don't have to. But I think, you know, this is a changing technology. And I think part of the way to deal with it best is under most circumstances, you know, take the path of least resistance. If the upgrade happens, upgrade. Right? Um, it also, for me, as much as I love it and I use it all the time, you know, it is just a phone, right? If, if I could make a phone call and something didn't work perfectly for a day, I can live through that. I'm probably one of the last people still makes a phone call with an iPhone, but I do. I make phone calls with it. And so, you know, I have a view of that the risk is not that high, right? That's really what I want to say. Um, but, you know, you don't have to do it. You can always wait until you're forced to do it. At some point, they will probably say you must upgrade because your phone won't work anymore. But that's a long way away. Okay, so let's get back to my question. Apps that people have that they like. Ways. W A Z E. It is a traffic. It shows accidents. You can. It's user input data. So if you if you're driving on the freeway, you see a cop hiding out. You can report the cop. And then all the other users will see cop at 100 feet. And uh, and you can report uh, standstill traffic. And you can report uh, accidents, vehicles on the side of the road. And um, it's like all cartoony. And it shows like all the different users all around you at all times. 
So um, it, I use that one every single day to figure out if I should go home by the 405 or the 605. <laughs> It is, it is crowdsourced traffic information. The scary part is that everyone's on their phones while they're driving, inputting, <laughs> but they have icons so that you can at least only touch the icon for the police officer. Instead of having to go, I'm driving, I have my phone. Police, wait a minute, police officer, I'm driving, I have my phone. Um, I wasn't texting while driving. I was I was calling. Yeah, he said he said put some Velcro on your on your dashboard yep. and then mount your case to it and then just slip it in and out of the case. And they make they actually make mounts for it because of course people use these as GPSs. Right. Yeah. So today, I mean, there are some nice things maybe about having those little Garmin or TomTom -Tom devices, but I don't know why. I mean, you could just use this, right? So Waze, what's another great app that people have? Talking just in general? Yeah, yeah. Besides Candy Crush? <laughs> All right, how many people play Candy Crush? I have never played it. I've only just heard about it. I've, I've heard about it. I have to use it. So now it's be a Candy Crush anonymous. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to check it out. I hear it's very addictive and everybody does it. What's that? I do pen ultimate, which is a drawing program. Okay. And that's really fun. You know, you draw with your finger or whatever. And then I do, I also have note taker, which is awesome for meetings because, you know, you can can either type or write, and it's like a yellow sheet of paper. I mean, it's great. Oh, that and one costs, so that was like $3 or something. And I, I promise Christiane. Pen ultimate. Pen ultimate. Yeah, P-E-N-U-L-I-T-M-A-T-E. One word? Yeah, and then note taker. I promised Christiane that I would also mention, because she sent this to me via email, she couldn't make it today, Easy PD. It is for teachers to keep track of their professional development. <laughs> and it allows you to um, augment what, you, what you're inputting with um, you know, attachments and pictures. And so you, know, you could be entering, I'm at the iPad thing, and take a picture. And, you know, and there's, there's your documentation. Your SLO evidence is right there. <laughs> I need easy accreditation is what I would prefer. Haiku deck is great for presentation. Yes. Um, I use Keynote, but I want to use my, it's free and it's really useful. Yes, hi, it's called Haiku deck. And uh, I almost used it for this, but I wanted to have something that could convert PowerPoint. So, you know, I did some more investigation. But Haiku deck is a simplified approach to a presentation. And H A I K U deck. And it really is nice. And it's not like PowerPoint, it's not complex. They offer a lot of beautiful uh, formats for you to take advantage of. And it's a really, it lets you focus on the content more than on the technical aspects of doing PowerPoint. And what was the other one you said? Uh, that's a type in deck. Oh, oh I said it. Oh, Keynote. Yeah. I use Keynote, but that's, you know, I like it because I can use it back and I can convert old PowerPoints into Keynotes and use them on my iPad. So I kind of go that route. Right. Do do people, yes? Oh, no, I was going to say, you know, when I mentioned it, I, I cannot be more of an advocate for no Tinker HD. Okay. No Tinker HD is, is absolutely phenomenal. It's not just taking notes. I, you can write on any PDF. So any PDF, I don't, for our the department head, for me, I don't have any forms anymore. Every key issuance form, every um, every single form I have on there, I just open it up, try the box, type in a name, and just sign it right on it, and email it back on the PDF. Mm -hmm. I, I just have I've a whole seen list. You do it. Of, yeah, I don't have to tell them. Yeah. No taker. No taker HD. Yeah, and so for all the, every other form, you just, I mean, put it in the top here, it comes out of the PDF, and you go right in the file, 
Excellent. See, I like that. Jerome. Uh, no tape is great, but I was, I've come across this program for about a year. It's called Evernote. Evernote is like, I don't know, it's a stir, it's notepad on steroids. Evernote <laughs> is, a, is a program that will run on your, your computer, it'll run on your phone, it'll run on your iPad. Does all platforms, by the way, Seats. Windows, Android, everything, Mac, PC. And because it's all <clears throat> cloud-based, everything syncs up. You make an account. So when you use, when I use Evernote on this, all the notes I wrote on my, on my laptop appear. And when I do this, of course, then they appear on my laptop. And so what I like about it, as opposed to the note program that's on this, is the ability to access it from all my devices. They even have a little plug-in for Outlook, where you're looking at an email, and you can just hit a button that says send to Evernote. I use it a lot, you know, because I, email is not always a great way to remember things or keep things in the front of my mind or, you know, there are things I just, I don't want to lose track of. And so I will throw it in Evernote and then it's much easier, you know, it's simpler for me to find um, instead of having, you know, the long list of emails that we all suffer with. And there's another one called Springy. Spring it, very much the same. Version, but it still does pretty yes. good as well. What's it called? Spring it. Not bring it, spring it. Okay. Spring it, <laughs> okay. not bring it. Spring it. Spring it. Spring it is the name. Somebody else must have, Jeff, you have an iPad sitting there. You must have a favorite app. Uh, I mean, I'm at the other Jeff. You putting Jeff? Who's Jeff on the spot? Or me on the spot? That Jeff on the spot. I happen to use it. I don't know if people have used Teachers Attaché. I, I, I did like the course. I feel like that's for keeping up the grade and in person presentation. That's kind of what's a good one. Okay. And can you say a little bit Teachers Attaché? Teachers Attaché. You can enter your description again and stuff like that. So you can keep track of attendance and everything. Okay. We have two versions, one for the iPhone and one for the iPad. I use the iPhone, it's a little bit worse. I use the iPad. Okay, well, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Again, I was honored to be able to be here.